Bene, buonasera. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the meeting with uh, Professor Shane Greenstein. I'd like to rapidly introduce him and to tell you what he does as a researcher. He's been a researcher for many years and he collaborated with many scholars. He has published a lot of articles on many journals. He's a Martin Marshall Professor of uh, Business Administration and he is a co-chair of the Harvard Business School for the Digital Initiative. He also has a lot of activities in uh, uh, the economy. He is the co-director of the program of digitization at the National Bureau of Economic Research. He <coughs> published uh, lots of books and many articles, in particular on the commercial development of the Internet and all the economic issues connected with the development of IT market. He uh, also publishes commentary on his blog called the Digitopoly, and uh, his work has been covered by media outlets ranging from the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and so on. Uh, I'm really impressed by the fact that but beyond uh, the subject of this talk, he uh, also studied the evolution of Wikipedia. He published uh, uh, interesting articles on that. He um, elucidated the mechanisms of creation of startups, the uh, environment where startups uh, uh, can be uh, started, companies uh, which uh, <coughs> were born outside the traditional markets, those who innovated and were able to uh, perform better than uh, consolidated uh, companies. Uh, the uh, companies present in the uh, market were, in a way, forced to innovate, to remain in the market, uh, i.e., how our outsiders, thanks to new technologies, could uh, become uh, leading companies in many segments of the market, how the Internet became commercial, a book published a few years ago, which was indeed uh, very successful uh, outside the U.S. The book analyzes how the Internet in less than a decade turned from being used by uh, universities and the army to something which is maybe the most powerful uh, commercial engine in the world. It was not a decision by the government. That was due because of innovations uh, brought by outsiders, the companies outside the mainstream governing the Internet and those who were outside the traditional markets. For that reason, uh, Internet uh, uh, developed and is prospering. Without that ability uh, to innovate, it's not necessarily that Internet would have become the powerful economic uh, driving engine of today. Those who could not uh, get adjusted to that uh, were doomed to fail, and that happened to many companies, as it happened also in Italy. They were uh, cast out of the market. So this is very uh, interesting, and indeed uh, we hear a lot about startups or uh, new <coughs> companies which are very innovative, who exploit uh, new uh, technologies and knowledge. It will be, it will be very interesting. Uh, to hear from you whether uh, you think that the uh, U.S. system, which is more dynamic than the Italian one, is a more fertile ground for the birth and the development of such companies, or conversely, whether uh, uh, the Italian market, which is pretty frozen because we have a lot of red tape, I mean, those who innovate find it much more difficult to emerge. I think that um, what you say is uh, perfectly in line with the title of the uh, festival of this year, which relates jobs and technology innovation. In the past, 
<clears throat> Any time a, a revolution happened, uh, somebody said, uh, well, technology will kill jobs. Uh, that might be the right time for that to happen. However, till we have, as long as we have uh, the ability to innovate, there will always be someone inventing something, using new technologies uh, to use them to create a new era for the economy. Most probably, uh, that prophecy uh, will continue to be denied. Now, uh, <coughs> the floor to Professor Greenstein without further ado. Um, very interesting subject. Please. Thank you. Do I? Um, no, no. No? To touch? Okay, good. Okay. Well, hello. It's a great pleasure to be here. The, the talk today is uh, Technology Markets for Innovators Who Are Outsiders. Uh, I tried to uh, orient it towards the theme of the, uh, the festival, and it will draw from the book. Um, again, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, the talk today will have four parts. Uh, I'm going to be a professor in the first part. I'm going to take you back to school, <laughs> give you a very abstract ten minutes. Try to try to stay awake. <laughs> then we'll illustrate with stories uh, of outsiders several stories and infer what we can from those stories. And then we'll look at the confrontation with insiders and what that looked like. And again, we will infer from that. And then we'll summarize again. Okay, so that's the plan. If I have to motivate this talk, I would start with the former Prime Minister of Britain, David Cameron. David Cameron used to ask many uh, students of innovation, why wasn't Google invented in Britain? Britain has universities that are world class, Oxford, Cambridge, many in London. Britain has finance that is world class. Britain has a very large labor market highly educated labor force, many scientists. Why didn't it happen in London? David Cameron wanted to know. That's a great question, isn't it? And I hope after the end of this talk, you'll understand how I would answer David Cameron. I would answer that you should look just beyond one particular firm, you should look at the whole system, and it should be a system that is friendly to outsiders. Okay, so what's the goal today? Is to develop an archetype, okay, a framework of an insider-outsider competition. What are the main features of entry by outsiders? How do established firms respond to them in markets? And we're going to be roughly inductive. I'm going to show you a, a, a lot of stories. But before we see the stories, I'll show, I'm just going to tell you the framework. <laughs> it may not make sense at first. And then I'll repeat the framework at the, at the end again. And I, and I want to say up front, this is U, US-centric. Uh, I'm going to use stories from my book. Uh, you know, I know what I know. So <laughs> I'm going to use uh, those examples. <laughs> The main point here is the outsiders hold a distinctive point of view. When you look at commercialization of technology, one of the interesting developments of the last 40 years is that there's no longer um, big differences between startups and established firms in their access to inputs into labor markets, into the technical frontier. It's what you might call an uncertain commercial opportunity, but they all see the same problem. How to meet demand, how to opera operationalize production and achieve scale. 
And both outsiders and insiders see the same scientific knowledge, the same frontier tools, the same engineering markets and talent. So how are they distinct? If they see the same inputs, what's the difference? And, and the thesis today is outsiders have a different point of view about how to commercialize technology. And the tension between the outsider's point of view and the insider's point of view is the fundamental tension that drives change in innovation markets today. So let me describe it. It may not make sense at first, but here it is. What happens at the beginning is there's a point of view. The outsiders have it. It's hidden. Be hidden. It takes one of two forms. Either it's inside of a university, so it's outside of the marketplace, so you don't see it. Or it's an immature entrepreneurial effort that's hidden in a broader movement. It, it doesn't look like anything anyone's seen before. The next thing that happens is there's learning. At these early moments, you see the outsider with a different point of view testing their ideas. They're looking for inexpensive prototypes. They're looking to extend the prototype. They're trying to understand what technical and distribution they need for the business. They don't know. They're trying to solve it. Sometimes they have help from venture capital, sometimes not. And then what happens? They get a prototype. They bring it to the market. And here is a key, a key observation. They experiment in the market. There's no way. It's too expensive to experiment in a laboratory. Nobody puts on a white coat, goes to the lab, sits down a bunch of people and says, would you buy this product? There's no way to get an honest answer. It has to be done in the market. There's no way to do in a laboratory set up scale production for 10,000 units in a day. You can't do it in a lab. You have to do it in a market to see how the organization works. So these aren't controlled experiments. It's not easy to, to see the, you know, a treated sample and an untreated sample. So it's very risky. But the outsiders will try to, do, uh, try to understand demand and try to understand operations. And what you'll observe is the insiders, will, they're no longer hidden once they begin to experiment this way. They will get a reaction from, outs from the insiders, established firms. They'll confront them. They'll compete. And it's what you might call differentiated competition because they have different points of view about how to address the market situation. And insiders will tend to favor the assets they've already built and the businesses they've already built. And the outsiders will tend to favor a different point of view and you have a market competition, and you see what happens. That's the whole framework. And I'm going to say, finish, when we get to the end, that this suggests what uh, economists would call asymmetric incentives to innovate. It's a Schumpeterian competition, which we, I'm, I'm assuming many people are familiar with. Yeah, it's Schumpeterian competition with asymmetric incentives. That's what this will suggest. That's what you see over and over again. Okay, so again, just to highlight it, and then we'll get to the details. The, the stories are more fun. Okay, if you're still awake, we're good. Okay, <laughs> so here are the details. What you tend to see, the gradual emergence of a point of view, it may not even reflect a commercial motive at first. It will not be visible. It will be outside the point of view of the insiders. It will require time and experimentation. It will rarely be a formed business at the beginning. Insiders will require time to experiment and prototype as well in order to react. And it will be very difficult, even from the stories I'll show you today, to make a generality about how, outside, uh, how insiders react to insiders. It, you see a wide variety of reactions. And what you always end up with at the end is differentiated competition. And uh, rarely are the, the, the insiders and outsiders pursuing the same goals or doing, going about the goals in the same way. OK? That's, that's where we're going. Uh, OK, if I was an academic, I, I have to do this. You know, what's novel here? First of all, is this a novel way of talking about the history of the commercial internet? If you really want to know more, buy the book, OK? It's, <laughs> it's a novel way of talking about creative destruction. So that's per perhaps the more interesting thing. 
it's, it's explaining why creative destruction is typically differentiated. It's, a, it's talking about industrial economics of innovation and trying to find a very specific role for a different point of view. And uh, at the very end, we'll talk a bit about innovation policy. It's, it, 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 with this view of the world, you have to have specific kinds of innovation policy. Okay? If you're awake, you're ready for some stories. <laughs> Let's start with internet in a box. Did any of you ever buy this product? Did anybody buy? Oh, nobody bought this product. This is a cute product, isn't it? It's a box. What do you think it does? <laughs> the internet's inside of it. This is from 1994. All it was was a CD-ROM <laughs> with a browser <laughs> and a, you know, a phone number that you could call. What were they doing? Well, the entrepreneurs who did this, they, they had a guess. They guessed at the time that the internet, uh, it was intimidating, that there were a lot of users who didn't un understand even how to do the basics, to, how to phone it up. So what did they do? They packaged it in a way that made it look very friendly and familiar. I technically, no advance here whatsoever, but it was the package, it looked like packaged software, it was very easy to buy, nobody had to explain it, it ran itself. What were they doing? They were making a guess about how to distribute it, how to price it, how to operate a business. This is a, just a fundamental choice about how to commercialize technology. And here's the key observation. There was no way to learn if this was going to work in a lab. You couldn't bring in 100,000 people and ask them if they would buy the product. There's only one way to learn. You put it on the shelf and see if anybody buys it. Okay, so it's a prototype. They put it on the shelf. Notice one other thing that they were doing. They're a specialist. Did they invent the entire network? No. They invented one thing. <laughs> it's to get access to the network. And that's all they did. No applications, nothing. Just, just access. Telephone number, a little bit of software, it worked on your PC. They were specialists, and they took for granted that everything else was going to be done, and they could just take it for granted. All right, how'd they do? Well, in a year, they sold their business for $100 million. <laughs> okay. Who, who bought it? Uh, CompuServe, actually. <laughs> So what, you know, what do you learn from this? Hmm, this, this, this looks so simple. And you'll see, we'll give you, I'll give you another example now. Another thing that outsiders do is they challenge consensus about value. So here, I'll give you another 1994 story. It's consensus that wasn't perceived, that the internet had value, that it could be used in clever ways, that you could build a browser business around it. Why didn't anybody see it? It's 1994. If you could have seen this in 1994, there's a lot of money to be made. Well, what was the problem? The problem was you had to see a working prototype. And it had to appeal to somebody other than the chief technology officer. It had to appeal to a CEO who wasn't technical. You had to be able to show it to a board of directors at a company. It had to be recognizable. This is Jim Clark. Jim Clark had built a few businesses. He went into this business. He founded this company with a few others. It's called Netscape. This is a quote from Jim Clark. I'd say there was a fair amount of skepticism at the time about whether the internet held any promise, and of course, I felt that it did. So he took a risk. Not much different from the firm we just looked at. He's a specialist. He took for granted that the rest of the network was going to work, and he decided to do one thing, and he was going to experiment in the market. There was no way to know if it was going to work until he tried to put it on the shelf and sell it. Well, how'd they do? Well, they hired a bunch of programmers. They built their business in six months. They put out a beta version of their software in November 1994, and they put out the final version in February of 1995 and they broke all uh, entrepreneurial records for sales. $150 million in their first year. 
of sales. Another thing outsiders can do, just to give you, uh, is they can experiment outside of a consensus. Here's a picture of a couple guys who did this. This is Larry Page and Sergey Brin. They were a few graduate students sponsored by the National Science Foundation inside of a computer science lab at Stanford University. Larry showed up um, in the spring of 1995 and asked his thesis advisor, he was a first year graduate student, maybe, uh, what about trying this idea, the, the, this, this ranking algorithm, why don't we try it on H HTML? Nobody had tried it before. <laughs> this advisor, uh, I have a wonderful interview with his advisor over this. His advisor had money from the National Science Foundation and had not promised this. <laughs> but he knew if it worked, he could go back and tell them it worked and they weren't going to complain. That the funding was open-ended. So he looked at him and he said, okay, go try it. So Larry went to go try it. He couldn't get it to work without a sufficient spider, a technically, a technically somebody that, that crawled the web. This is why he got a partner. His partner was Sergey Brin, who had the best spider of any of the graduate students he, he could find in the neighborhood. And together they built this prototype. They just sat there. I, I want to emphasize this. The first Google experiment ran on a server, and they took classes for two years. <laughs> we say in retrospect, wait a minute, <laughs> they had this invention. Nah, they were students. They, they put it up on a server, they let everybody else use it. They patented it. The university tried to find a buyer. Maybe they asked too much money. Nobody would license it. This is true story. And the fact was, by 1998, Larry and Sergey were kind of disappointed. They thought they had a good invention, and nobody wanted to use it. And they had finished classes. They had even written two papers. They were almost done with their thesis but they were really upset that they made this invention and nobody thought it was useful. So what did they do? They said, oh, we're just gonna show people how useful it is. So they decided to start a business. So they started Google in 1998, uh, and um, no, that's because they couldn't get a license. And they ran the search business for three years with very minimal revenue with some venture capital funding, some angel funding. And the part that most of you know now, the auction uh, for ads, that wasn't invented until 2002, so four years after they started the firm. That's an imitation of all the other ad, uh, auctions. And uh, it has a, it's a, you know, again, the, the book talks a lot about this. It's a second price quality weighted position auction. It's a mouthful. It, it was basically an imitation of all the other auctions that were being tried at the time, but it was done in a way that was consistent with the Google model. The Google model was unique in that it was consumer friendly. It didn't sell search to anyone. The search was always oriented towards what was most useful to the user. None of the other search engines were exactly oriented the same way. And moreover, they were doing things that were regarded as completely outside of commercial norms. They banned ads for tobacco, alcohol, and sex. All they were trying to do was match ads to the users. That was their goal. Okay, so it was a very different point of view of how to make a search engine. And in fact, was not very profitable at the beginning but they stuck to their point of view and continued to develop it. Okay, so those are three examples. Let me, let's back up a little bit. A, a question you might ask now at this point is, well, what enables these kinds of outsiders? Why do they show up? What are they, what are they doing there? How, how come they're, uh, they're able to survive and thrive? 
Well, uh, first things is that they can be supported by venture capital. And I love this example. It's a wonderful example. All right. Let's see if you're still alive. Uh, how many of you have an e email? Uh, hands? Okay. Now, oh, come on. The, how many of you have email? Yeah, come on. Seriously. Yeah, it, it, you know, it's got to be 100%. Sh surely. Okay. Uh, now, I got to ask, how many of you have Hotmail? Because it's still got to be some Hotmail out there. Yeah. All right. We got some Hotmail. Yeah. That's great. Okay. S right. Still the second most popular email system, uh, email in the world. Okay, so invented in 1995, uh, Hotmail. Uh, do you know why it was called Hotmail? I, I like to put it always, it's just a little factoid. Let's see if I can get this. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Look, at the, look at the name. It's HTML. Oh, is that nerdy? Okay. Uh, yeah, it's a, oh. Yeah, they, uh, the, the guys who did this, the two guys who invented Hotmail are real nerds. They, it's just, you got to love them. They are outsiders. They were just a couple programmers. One of them is uh, Indian citizen, I mean Indian immigrant. The other one is um, uh, yeah, U.S. citizen. They were programmers at another company. They had, they had used an HTML browser, and they were trying to do email but not let their boss see what they were doing. And the way to do it was to do it on an HTML browser and then, you know, hide it. <laughs> and it occurred to them that none of the email systems at the time were HTML compatible, so they could make one, and Hotmail was the first one that did. That's really it. It's a very beautiful little invention. They're special. Notice, by the way, they're specialists. They did one thing well. They had a different point of view. And there was no way to know if it was going to work until they tried it. So they went to VCs to get a little bit of funding because they could see they needed some servers to run the hot, uh, Hotmail system that they had in mind, on a, and it would take a little bit of money. And, uh, and they needed to run it in the market. So they invented this, this uh, method for trying to make uh, it popular. And one of the methods they invented was to put in the footer of the uh, Hotmail, you know, get your Hotmail from somebody, somebody else. If you ask a computer scientist at the time whether it was OK to put a hot link at the bottom of an email message, you would have been told no, not to do that because that violates one of the cardinal rules of programming, which is it mixes languages. And it violated this, this um, absolute wall between the content of the message and the, the uh, <laughs> language out, outside the message. So actually doing what they were doing, having a hot link in the, in the, in the email, this was considered heretical at the time. So here's the venture capital, Tim Draper, who eventually lent them money. <laughs> it, how, it, by the way, how long did it take Tim and his partners to decide to lend them money? Two days. They came to a deal in, in 48 hours. And Tim is the one who suggested that they put the, the link in the bottom of the, of the email. And where did he get this idea? He, he actually got it from Tupperware. This is one of, the, uh, one of the wonderful things about doing interviews for this book is, you know, sometimes when someone tells you a story, you know they just couldn't make that up because that's just too crazy to, you know, <laughs> to be a lie. It has to be true. And this, one, this was an example. Tim, he said he was, looking at, he was looking at Hotmail and he was thinking, how can we distribute this and not, do it, uh, not be expensive? And he thought, oh, Tupperware, you tell your friends and you try to sell to your friends and friends sell to your friends. So email systems, you can sell to your friends and sell to your friends. Yeah, that was the key insight. Today we call that viral marketing. And, uh, the, you know, it was a small little innovation for one little product that then was imitated by everybody else. Okay, so the point of this example was that you get support from venture capital. Another thing that enabled the, spe the specialists and the outsiders is open governance. So open governance uh, is, uh, is actually a sort of a complicated topic. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you mostly the overview. Open governance means uh, that you have an architecture that does not limit information to an application provider. 
and there's no limits on how information is used. So it's a set of principles for giving discretion to the specialists. That's the easiest way to say it. The specialists can see anything they want, and they can do anything they want with the information. A lawyer, if we had lawyers, a lawyer in the room, a lawyer in the room would say there were no reach-through rights. So the, there's the, part, the business partner has no right to limit the other side. That's, that's the key thing. Okay, now why did we have that? Well, it's a long story, and I have to admit it. So you've got to read the book to find out. <laughs> but we should thank Tim Berners-Lee for this, <laughs> primarily. Uh, and uh, because he developed the World Wide Web in such a way as to make it uh, open and, and have open governance. And that enabled a lot of discretion from others. A third thing that uh, enables discretion by specialists is the technical meritocracy. Uh, and again, I don't know what other label to give it. Uh, a technical meritocracy is a situation where good code, good technology, is always, the technical assessment is always prim the primary thing that matters. So the age or ethnic or national background of the person who does the code doesn't matter. Now, and all the examples I just gave you, a number of them are immigrants, a number of them are students, some of them are young. It didn't matter. The point was they did good code. Now, the interesting thing you ask, can it, how can that happen independent of a social setting without a hierarchy? It's true. There is a social setting. Oftentimes, the university serves as a certification or the or really the venture capitalists just evaluate the code themselves. They look themselves, so they hire an expert and they look. Um, but th there's often a signal of the origins. You can see good code. The other thing that often that, that pushes this is what I call pragmatic impatience. Many people are just looking for the best thing at the time, and they, they want it to work right now. So the example I give for this is, is from the University of Illinois. Uh, Rob McCool built a web server that used what we still use today, CGI uh, the script, which is, moves code back and forth between the browser and the server. So we, all of our electronic commerce still uses it today. Um, this is Rob. And uh, you know, it's, it was the best code out there. And, and uh, nobody cared who Rob was. They, uh, he was just put it up on shareware, and everybody used it. Now, the funny thing about this story is Rob decided to leave the University of Illinois. And so the code was just there, but Rob wasn't. Uh, and so eventually, somebody had to take it over. And a group of programmers did and uh, started an open source program known as Apache. And uh, this is the most widely used server on the internet today still. Okay? And again, it's just it's good code. Uh, the, the, the point of the story is that technical achievement overcomes all the barriers. OK, so you, you might reasonably be asking at this point, what role did policy play? That's a reasonable question to ask here. There are two kinds of policies. One is commercialization policy. One is policy for the university. Uh, I'll come back to it, but let me do a brief digression and say commercialization policy, the key things here are policies that limit concentration through structural limitations on mergers and, di and divestitures, limiting distortions of monopolies on complementary markets. In this, act, in this place, it was, it was primarily the telephone firms who were limited, and uh, a series of competitive rules to protect competitive processes for its own sake, uh, which it nurtures different points of view. There's another set of policies having to do with transferring technologies out of universities uh, that mattered. I think it's going to take too long to talk about that today, so I'm just going to skip it if you really care. <laughs> this is something that some people really care about, but um, if you want to, you have to sort of read the book. So, <laughs> okay. So summarizing, entry. You know, what, what factors enable outsiders to play a role? Remember this? So... The outsiders have a different points of view. We just said this. They n have a different view about where, op where demand lies or about how to operationalize things or how to scale an organization. They tend to remain, it tends to remain hidden. It tends to remain outside the consensus. It, there's experiments in universities to support it, maybe a new customer base or operation to support it. 
it tends to use the same knowledge. We, it's living in a world of dispersed tactical knowledge. Insiders and outsiders aren't any different. It tends not to depend on hierarchy. It's getting the same financing as everyone else. And it lives with experiments in the market. Okay, so they perceive opportunities, they have a different point of view, they experiment, they partner, they use open standards, and really interesting is things accumulate from the outsiders. And they all have this different point of view. And that's, that's the entry part. Okay? That's, uh, that's most of the framework. You might then say, well, what do insiders do? Insiders aren't, you know, they're not just going to sit there. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's, it's actually not complicated. Uh, let me give you a couple. So the key question is, how do insiders respond? And, and the key point to recognize is, what would the insider have done had the outsider not entered? And then, how do you compare what they did do with what they did, would have done? So, and I'm just going to offer a thesis that I think would be fairly straightforward. Had uh, um, that, the, that the entry of the outsider generates a reaction and a set of actions from the insider that they would not have otherwise done. That's the thesis. And you, I think it'll be very obvious once you uh, see how it works. You might, you might say, well, what would they have done? No, well, basically, they're going to continue to do what they did otherwise. And just to, just to be a professor for a second, uh, why is that? Because... An established firm has a tendency to do what it's already doing. It will tend to invest in ways that are consistent with its present business. It will rarely cannibalize its own business unless someone makes them. It will underinvest in prototypes that are inconsistent with its business. And it can't plan for everything. They will have a tendency to use their existing products, use their existing workforce, and use their existing firm-wide assets in ways that get a return on those assets. It's just the way business works. And then the outsider shows up. They're a catalyst to action because they have either one of three things. They have a new product that develops outside the control of the insider. The prototype reduces revenue, possibly at the insider. Or it demonstrates a demand that the insider had not otherwise appreciated. Okay. So a couple examples, and we're done. Let me use one example, Microsoft, wonderful example. The place to start with this example is to recognize that Bill Gates was the best CEO of his generation. Let's just start there. The best CEO of his generation made a mistake. He didn't understand the internet. That should tell you everything you need to know. No CEO, even the best CEO of his generation, can anticipate everything. It doesn't matter how good he plans. So he missed it. So what happened? Well, it's actually kind of an interesting thing. He ended up writing this famous memo that was alarmed by the lack of control and the potential threat to revenue. Where did that actually come from? It actually comes from this guy, Ben Slivka. Ben Slivka was an employee at Microsoft. Uh, he was part of a small team who were convinced that Bill was wrong. So this is a fascinating story of uh, an argument inside of a firm where the 1994, Bill Gates had said, this is not, this is not a part of our business. We're not going to be in this business. And there were a number of people who were convinced their boss was wrong. And they were so loyal to him that they took time out of their day to study the alternative point of view. Ben Slivka, just to give you an illustration, wrote four versions of these, this study. And the fourth version is a 20-page memo, single-spaced, describing the coming commercial internet. Bill Gates cribbed from that for his famous eight-page memo, The Internet Tidal Wave. That's that's how a, CE, a great CEO works. When his employees show up for him and tell him that he's wrong and they make a 20-page paper to try to argue, Bill paid attention, went surfing, 
and he was convinced and he changed his mind. So the short version of this story is, why did they change their point of view? Because somebody paid attention to the outsiders, described what they were doing, and the CEO listened. Let me use another example. I love this example. IBM is a, a wonderful illustration. Again, we should start here. IBM is the single best computing firm for large organizations. Okay, let's just start there. The single best computing firm for large organizations missed the internet also. <laughs> so, what did they actually miss and what did they get right? It's actually kind of an interesting question. What they missed were the inexpensive HTML software. What did they get right? They had demand completely right. If you went to their lab in 1995, they had built prototypes for everything we now recognize in electronic commerce. They had seen it, all their researchers, they knew what was coming. But they had the wrong components. They didn't understand that they needed to use open systems. And so they had the prototypes, but not with web technology. So this guy, Irving Vodolsky Berger, had the terrible, I think, career-defining task of trying to do the internet strategy in IBM. Really wonderful guy, you know. Uh, the fact that he was willing to be, he was willing to be interviewed is, is very interesting. And he had to organize what we now recognize, what we now recognize as middleware software, and organize that for IBM. And you should be clear, this is not a glamorous activity. <laughs> it's f functionally messy. It's, it's, it's about logistics. Uh, it's, it's about organizing order fulfillment inside of a large company. And um, it's extremely valuable. And this is what IBM did. How did they do it? Just like we've seen before. They looked at the outsider's point of view. They recognized what they had missed. They made new prototypes. They showed the prototypes to their buyers. The buyers liked the prototypes. And they changed their investment behavior as a result. It's just, just as business works. I'm making a long story very short, by the way. I mean, the very, very painful process for IBM and a very valuable uh, change for them. Okay, last illustration. This is the last one, and this is the last of, an, of insiders responding. Wi-Fi. You all know what Wi-Fi is? You know, wireless internet access. Do you know where it comes from? Yeah, yeah. 802.11b uh, is the, uh, the IEEE standard that everybody uses. Okay, what was the first product to use it? It's the Apple Airport. Does anybody have an Apple Airport? It's always fun. Oh, we got a couple. Oh, yeah, yeah. OK. So the Apple Airport was in, uh, actually an invention from Steve Jobs, who came back as CEO to Apple in 1998. And the firm was on the verge of bankruptcy. And his view was, as an outsider, to bring some innovation into the computer industry. So Steve wanted a wireless laptop. And this, you know, make a long story short, that's how we got the Apple Airport. His actions motivated Michael Dell, you know Dell Computer, it motivated Michael Dell to try to do the same thing, because Michael Dell hates being beat by Steve Jobs. <laughs> Michael Dell then called up Microsoft and they got a new release of Windows so that it was compatible with 802.11b. Then the other OEMs started to adopt it too because they hated being beat by Michael Dell. At that point, Intel hated Michael Dell telling them what to do. So Intel then changed what it did and adopted Centrino, which then supported ubiquitous Wi-Fi on all laptops across the whole world. So what happened here? Again, you get the whole value chain changing its point of view about what's valuable because one outsider showed up and tried to do something. And again, it's the insiders all reacting because they see the different point of view and then they recognize the value that's being created there. Okay, so summarizing. Why do act, outsiders act as catalysts? The experiments might not have been done. It makes insiders consider demand they might not have considered. 
they might do prototypes they would not have otherwise done. It changes the direction of investment. It necessarily changes the experiments. And here's the last key thing, it takes time. So it's value is unknown, it takes time to reorganize production, and you need the competitive situation to sort it out. All right, I think I'll skip this because we've seen this. And a tiny bit of policy and we're done. All right, so that's it, that's the framework. So what policies nurture this? Uh, the, here's the central problem. The central problem is most outsiders, most outsiders are fools. Uh, what's the Italian for a fool? Uh, the, uh, clowns. Let's see. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so most outsiders, as it turns out, aren't very insightful. Visionari, direi. <laughs> And a few of them are geniuses. And so the, the basic problem for policy is that you can't forecast a winner, but you must keep the situation open for any outsider who shows up who's a genius. And I always say, if you want an illustration, the best illustration I know is from about a dozen years ago. Who would you have given money to in 2004, 2005? Would you have given it to a cable company? Looks pretty profitable. Or would you have given it to a Harvard undergraduate with a new social network? <laughs> right, and it's just it's very, very difficult to anticipate who the genius is. So policy, as a result, has this very difficult problem. It has to remain open to uh, any kind of point of view for its own sake, even though there isn't someone there necessarily to be a constituent for that. I think in my own experience, I've found that venture capitalists tend to be the biggest constituents for these kinds of policies because they, they see it more directly. Um, you know, historically, we can look at the uh, commercial internet and ask whether these things were there, and in fact, they are. You can actually find them. There were things to protect and enable outsiders. There was uh, policy to eliminate concentration, enable user choice, uh, enable openness. I mean, I'll say, you know, you can read the book. It's a lot of detail. And to protect outsiders. <laughs> And what's really fascinating when you look at it today and you look at the debate today, there's still some recognition of this in policy circles. I listed a couple things up here. But really, quite frankly, it's absent from a lot of conversation. And so um, that's, that, that concerns me. And I, you know, for, for the policy world, that's a, that's a big concern. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for your attention. Grazie, professore, per questa interessante. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Thank you very much for your uh, overview. I'll ask a couple of questions uh, to the professor, but then uh, we'll ask uh, the uh, questions to the floor. Now, I have a few questions to ask you. Now, first of all, now, when it comes to all big revolutions, uh, we usually have a lot of stories, stories of people, uh, stories of fools, of visionaries uh, that have intuition, insights, and that have somehow changed the world. If you were to, you know, name the hero of this revolution, who would you mention? Who would come to mind to you? See, uh, yeah, Tim, Bern Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, um, Tim Berners-Lee could have made a lot of money. Instead, he chose to make his parents proud. Um, uh, he gave away his invention, and it enabled many other people to invent things. Uh, he's, he's a big hero. Uh, uh, and then I have a curiosity. To what extent uh, do outsiders uh, become insiders? Uh, and when they become insiders and they become large companies, and we have a lot of examples, do they forget that once upon a time they were outsiders? 
Yes, they do sometimes. Um, Bill Gates is a, is a particularly good example of that. Uh, he, he benefited from the very same policies that he then tried to subvert um, when, when he was on the, uh, the other side of it. Um, it's a bigger question today about whether Google and Facebook are uh, behaving the same way. Uh, I think a bigger, uh, I think the interesting question is whether policy um, reminds the uh, former outsider uh, that they have an obligation to protect and preserve yeah. competitive processes. Um, I think that one of the lessons of this era um, was that policy was a little slow to do that uh, and um, the policy has been much faster I think in this era in reminding Google and Facebook both early and, and frequently about it and, uh, and I think actually it's, we've avoided some things that could have been worse you know we don't get to see the alternative right uh, <laughs> Uh, but but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, I think actually we've avoided worse things because they've been reminded uh, quite frequently already. It's a great question. Unultima. I have another question. Then we'll open up to the floor. I have a question which is connected to what we have just said. Now the creativity gave uh, a number of companies the possibility to grow uh, into the market, but a number of risks uh, have uh, emerged. Uh, risk, risks, uh, for instance, uh, to the labor market. Uh, I'm thinking about Amazon. Here in Italy, at least, uh, they do not respect fully the workers' uh, rights, and I think this is a problem that has to be tackled. And then another question, which I think is a bit more delicate, is the defense of uh, personal data privacy. A few days ago here in uh, Europe, uh, a new European regulation has been enforced uh, for the protection of uh, personal data. And for the first time, uh, such regulation uh, envisages uh, severe penalties uh, uh, for those uh, who do not uh, comply with the uh, right to privacy. No? And when I speak of a personal data, it refers to you know our tastes in terms of you know clothing, but also health, uh, you know, or personal data. I guess uh, there should be a limitation to the pervasiveness of such uh, uh, tools. Uh, these are such tools that get into our own private world. You know, the, the, these kinds of rules on, uh, are not going to have any are not going to uh, make a large difference to the largest firms. They're going to be able to deal with them. They have the money to do so. I think the, uh, the question policy maker would need to ask it um, is whether a young firm, it's about the young firm you don't see, uh, whether a young firm has to get a half a million dollars of legal help in order to start their business in order to address those regulations? That's, that, that's, the, that's the hard question that should be asked. Uh, and that would, be a, um, that would be a deterrent to growth and to entrepreneurship. Um, it, uh, you know, it, and if, if not, I mean, if, if it's possible to comply without a, high, without a, a particularly difficult expense for an entrepreneurial firm, then, then that's great. If, if it's expensive, uh, legally expensive, it's, I, I suggest it's actually potentially not a good policy and maybe needs modification for entrepreneurial firms. Okay. Mm. And such regulation uh, envisages a number of costs uh, for companies, as a matter of fact. Okay, let us uh, open up the debate to the floor. Any question from the floor? And please use the microphone, otherwise we can't hear the question and we can't translate it. Thank you. Jaime, you introduced the principle of technical meritocracy, so how the Internet works. And nowadays we see all the businesses and with the Internet that we 
became commercial, all the businesses were starting their businesses on internet and then moving, let's see Amazon, and then moving. Scusi, signorina, l'altro microfono. Teniamone uno solo perché sennò all'interprete arrivano due voci. Basta uno. Ok, scusa. Oh, and so then starting from the internet and then moving in the re real world. How do you think the collapse of net neutrality? And so once, imagine, when you, when, you, when you study real estate, you say three things are important, location, location, locations. Once you had net neutrality, you didn't have this principle of location on the internet. And whatever the idea was coming from, it was worthy. And that's why technical, I think, maybe what I see is that technical meritocracy was coming also from that. Once you have the importance of location without net neutrality on the mm -hmm. internet, how this will affect outsiders? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, so there's two things there. Um, uh, one, in, uh, you know, until now, uh, we've had a set of policies that uh, in, um, were effectively neutral, and so I think uh, it's not a concern until recently and uh, and so the question about what changes in net neutrality policy will have for uh, new startups going forward um, is a question about what it, net neutrality will look like um, going forward I think this uncertainty alone has already created um, some cost and some deterrence uh, and, uh, and then beyond that uh, and it's hard to measure because we don't see it right? we, it's the world we, it's the entrant who doesn't show up because they're too worried about something a, uh, a year from now or two years from now uh, the, the big concern and this is the concern inside uh, the VC community in the United States now is if they get another streaming firm they can't get it to work on all the uh, all the broadband lines. They have a problem with one of the large carriers. And they they need uh, legal help to get you know to fight it. Why you know then why did you start a firm? The, the, the VCs won't, once they have an experience like that, they aren't going to start firms in those businesses. Um, so at this point, we're not there. Uh, uh, I think that particular nightmare is unlikely for another year or two. So what we're observing for the time being is merely the uncertainty created by not knowing where this is going to settle uh, and what legal rules, exact legal rules, will be settled on. And then um, the second step of this, uh, I, I, it's, just, it's just too far off. We don't know yet. Uh, and, and that's a pretty interesting question. I think it actually hangs over the market right now quite a bit. As I say, it hangs over in a certain set of applications, things like streaming, uh, uh, things that need to work with a lot of different, um, they need to work on wireless and wireline, a lot of different carriers, typically across uh, multiple markets and multiple carriers. That's, that's where the, the uncertainty hangs right now. Hmm? Un'ultima domanda. Perché ci sono altri eventi in contemporanea. Eh, as you said, it's, itself, uh, it, it's not commercial. I mean, it was, it's not a commercial product. There is an, an, uh, an example on the World Wide Web of a big website, which is not commercial, which is Wikipedia. You did uh, research on that. Can I ask you a few words about that? If, if it's, a few words, obviously, just. Sure. Wikipedia is a wonderful example of um, uh, a, a non, right, it's non-commercial. Um, it's it's a crowdsourced text. Uh, it's one of the wonderful things you can do with the internet because it uh, allows uh, inexpensive access to a large set of readers and a large set of contributors. Um, and. Uh, Wikipedia, uh, the, the interesting thing for uh, Wikipedia for an economist is there's no pricing. <laughs> so there's, there's, no, there's no classic way to measure its productivity, if you want to say, call it that. 
and there's no classic way to measure its contribution to the economy because it registers nothing in GDP. Uh, and, and so uh, a really hard question um, is, is how do you think about its value in light of next best alternatives? So the amount of revenue that's been displaced in the English language reference market is several billion dollars. Somehow that seems like uh, not en you know, enough value for something that is accessed uh, by 8 billion people a month. <laughs> Somehow, you know, a couple billion dollars doesn't seem like the right valuation. So displacement value doesn't seem to be the right value. And, uh, and exactly what the right value is, we don't have a good feel for it. Um, the, the topic we looked at was the productivity side of the question. So we asked the question, how quickly does high quality emerge in, from an article? Um, and in particular, in its most difficult places, and when there are arguments about uh, things that are fundamentally difficult to resolve, controversial topics, um, subjective facts, political discussions. And, and I would say Wikipedia works really well when you have objective data. So the, it, uh, it works ex actually extraordinarily well. You know, if you look up the science of, you know, penguins, I mean, it's, you know, and chemistry and mathematics, it's, it's remarkable. It's a little more challenging to look up the entry for uh, a political figure and particularly a living political figure. Uh, I haven't looked up Donald Trump's uh, recently. Uh, you know, I remember Barack Obama's and George Bush's always had a lot of difficulty. So uh, what colleague, Feng Shu, one of my colleagues at uh, HBS and I, what we did is we tried to look at how quickly articles would come to represent multiple points of view, uh, which is one of the aspirations Wikipedia has for itself. And, and the answer is uh, it, it performs remarkably well if it has uh, a large number of contributors. And uh, one of the things we walked, you know, to make a long story short, one of the things we walked away with is um, Wikipedia has a manpower issue. That it, uh, it works extremely well uh, for the uh, articles that have a lot of contributions. And... Um, and just the basic problem it's got is it's got a far larger readership uh, than it has a, a, you know, a set of people to contribute, which is another way of saying if you want to do something and be good, good for society, help Wikipedia. Okay, so that's, a, uh, that's the conclusion. And then what we're doing now is we're looking at the, um, segregated conversation, so echo chambers on Wikipedia. Uh, you know, do red people talk to red people and blue people talk to blue, or do they, do they cross over? And again, the answer turns out is that Wikipedia is remarkably good um, at resolving echo ch the problems with its echo chambers. And, and it's for the same reasons that um, uh, uh, the, the platform is designed to give a large discretion to its crowd. It makes its aspirations very clear. The, the crowd... The, the contributors will have a debate about whether their particular actions um, are consistent with the aspirations, uh, and it's not algorithmic based. It's you know there's no uh, it's all human based. It's uh, and and so it it ends up they debate among themselves and again they when there's a large enough base of contributors it works really well and the again if for echo chambers on Wikipedia the central problem turns out to be just do you have a large enough number of contributors. That's, that's, that's the short version of it. It's, it's a by the way, right? It's Wikipedia is uh, you know 15 years old. It's an absolutely remarkable uh, contribution to the, to the world. By the third largest collection of um, it's the third, not yet. It's not the largest. It's the third largest collection of uh, writing by human beings ever put together into one source. The, the, the first and the second, the second one is the Library of Congress, and number one is the British Library. But Wikipedia is getting close. It's going to bypass them soon. Bene, io ringrazio.
Thank you very much, Professor Shane Greenstein. Thank you very much to you all. I think uh, this discussion has been very, very interesting about issues uh, that are really topical, as we say, we journalists, uh, very, very important uh, topics. Thank you very much again, Professor Greenstein. Thank you.